It's time for Tycoons of Small Biz, spotlighting the true backbone of the American economy, the true tycoons of business in America, the owners, founders, and CEOs of small businesses. The show's hosts, Austin Peterson and Landon Mance, are registered representatives of Lincoln Financial Advisors Corporation, a broker-dealer, member SIPC, and registered investment advisor. The views expressed by your hosts, Austin and Landon, are not necessarily the views of Lincoln Financial Advisors. Let's lean in as Austin and Landon connect with this week's Tycoons. Good afternoon, Tycoons, and welcome to today's episode of Tycoons of Small Biz. I'm your host, Austin Peterson. My co-host, Landon Mance, is here with me today, and we are excited to have in studio today Ryan Weissmuller of Intrepid Solutions here in Scottsdale. Ryan, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so Ryan, we always like to, to start by having our guests tell, them, tell us a little bit about themselves personally. Um, we're big believers that personal comes before business, mm -hmm. and so we think that uh, it'd be great to hear about your family, your personal life, what kind of led you to where you are today, if you're okay with that. Absolutely. Uh, well, first off, uh, Arizona native, so born, born and raised in the Phoenix area. I, I love this community. It's my home, and I, I've been fortunate to spend uh, my entire career here. I had, had opportunities early in my career to travel all over, but uh, realized this is where I wanted to, wanted to stay. Um, third generation entrepreneur, my, my grandfather and, and father both watched them um, you know, grow and evolve their own businesses so that that uh, connection to the entrepreneurial community has, has always been something uh, very close to, close to the heart. Uh, I have two kids, and in fact, uh, 13 days from now, my, my oldest, my daughter, gets her driver's permit, so that's probably the biggest stress in my life right now. Should be. Um, but, uh, but no, like, things, are, things are great. I mean, obviously, we're going through some, some crazy times right now as a people, as a world, and certainly this community, but uh, I, I, it's been amazing to watch how Phoenix has evolved and, and Arizona and just the the business community in general, and it's um, it's exciting. It, it it really is. So I'm very blessed, love to be able to to do what I do every day. Yeah, no, that that's awesome. So almost 16 year old, it sounds like, is yep. the oldest, and yep. then the age of the other one. Uh, he is uh, going on 13. Okay, so girl and a boy. Yep, older girl, younger boy. Yep. Okay. So we stay busy. Yeah, no, I trust me. I I'm about three years, four years ahead of you. Okay. And it's switched. So the okay. older one for me is the boy, and then the younger one is the girl, and um, I tell you what, that, uh, driver's permit and sending them out for the first time was one of the scariest things of my life. Um, and it was different for me than, than I think it was for my parents because I grew up on a farm. Mm. And so I started driving tractors and motorcycles and all of that at a very young age. And my kids were, you know, at a parking lot learning how to drive the car for the first time when they were 15 years old, whereas I started probably eight, seven, eight years old. So yeah, it's, it's different and it's scary. And, you know, my 17 year old is the youngest um, and she's, you know, had her license a little over a year and she's still a little uncomfortable on the freeway. So it, yeah, trust me, I, I feel that stress and, and understand what you're going through. And, and I don't worry about her so much. It's everybody else. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And, and what I learned which was surprising is that nowadays uh, insurance is not any difference price wise between boys and girls where when we were growing up, it was always higher for boys. But now because of the texting, it's just as high for girls as, uh, as it was or as it is for boys. So you're, you're going to be excited to have her added to your insurance. I, I, I have not soon. placed that call yet. I'm afraid to, <laughs> but it's, it's coming. Yeah, you, you should be. All right, so tell us a little bit about Fintrepid Solutions. Just kind of give us the, the background on what it is that you guys do, and then obviously we've got some questions for you, and we look forward to hearing about it. Absolutely. So really, we uh, started the firm going on four and a half years ago, um, and it honestly was at a point in my career, just to give you a little of the background, where I, I had left my prior role and, and wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do, and um, had a couple calls of, hey, Company A, can you come help us with this? Company B, can you come help us with this? And, and um, that's really what got me thinking. I, I didn't necessarily have plans of starting the firm, but it, it sort of happened a little bit organically. And we've evolved. And, and so really where we fit in the ecosystem is, is our client is that small and mid-sized, mostly 90% of them are founder-led entrepreneurial businesses. And we partner with them to navigate the challenges that they face as they grow and evolve over time. So 
you know, so many of these companies, very successful businesses have gotten to a certain point, but they're dealing with things they either don't have the bandwidth, the experience, the skill set, uh, you know, maybe expanding into a new market. Maybe all of a sudden they've, they've reached a level where they're on the radar of their competition and how do we deal with that? Um, you know, buying and selling for the first time, we're involved with that. So we've just found that we've really got a, a, a skill set in helping clients navigate through those areas. We, we've lived it ourselves. I spent most of my career actually in those same kinds of businesses. So, um, you know, we, we talk about making things work with popsicle sticks and paper glue all the time, because sometimes that's what you have to do when, when you're a small and, and mid-sized business. And so we've been able to leverage that, that experience. I've been blessed with a, an, an outstanding team that shares that same passion and, um, you know, our kind of our guiding credo is we want to add value. So if, if it's an area that we can add value, we know where our skill set is, we know where our lane is. And um, it's, it's been a fun ride. It really has. Yeah. No, that's, that's very cool. And, you know, sometimes you just fall into business. There, there are many entrepreneurs who have just kind of gotten asked to do certain things and then realize, man, you know, maybe I could start a business doing this. And um, that's exciting to, you know, hear how you got started. And for us, I mean, we, we started this program just to highlight small businesses in the area because we truly believe that they are the backbone of the economy. There's a huge percentage of small businesses in this country. Everybody knows the big name businesses, but most people actually work for a small business. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's, it's an underserved community in, in our estimation. And that's why we started this program. And it's great to have you in because you're not only a member of that community, but you serve our entire community of, of business owners. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's cool. I'm, I'm excited to learn more about it. So Landon, you want to ask him a little bit about uh, what it is that they're doing each day? Yeah. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, yeah. So uh, Ryan, um, you know, I, I think that survive and thrive has kind of been a, a, a motto or, or maybe a rallying uh, cry for you and your team. So which seems, um, especially relevant uh, in these days. So uh, talk to us just a little bit about what that, what that means to you and your team. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly none of us saw um, what, what hit us in, in mid-March, really when the, when the economic disruption or that, that big shoe fell. Um, and, and I think, you know, we were obviously knee deep in it with a lot of our clients. We had companies that were, were hit over the head with a two by four that, that first day where basically, you know, their customers stopped buying. And, and certainly the tendency was originally it was, okay, how do we just navigate, get to the next day, get to the next week, et cetera. And, and I think once, once that initial, maybe panic's not the right word, but just shock, once that initial shock set in, um, you know, the, the thing we saw with so many companies out there and just, and, and we've lived, I mean, I remember the Great Recession, you know, I, I dealt with, um, you know, dealt with some different, uh, you know, collapses in different areas over the years, my partner had as well. Um, it, it, we saw that, that so many of these businesses and had really good leadership in place that it wasn't just about how do we keep the doors open? It's, we're not only going to get through this, but there's opportunities to actually come out of this, uh, either come out of it position to strike or potentially even take advantage of this and, and maybe pick up some market share. Um, I mean, we've got a, a, a good client of ours that we're working with that is literally stealing business away right now from a competitor that's 30 times their size. That shouldn't happen if, if you really think about it. But again, they, their focus has been how do, we, how do we serve? How do we tweak our model a little bit to make some of these things work that were never possible before? So for us, that's really been where the focus is. And, and you know, some days with our clients, um, we're there to just encourage them and, and to, to explore what's possible and talk to them about, okay, what if, what if we explored A, B, C, and D? Because the the, 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 if you can find a silver lining about challenges in the market like this, it's a great time to, to wipe the slate clean and reimagine where you are and where you could go. I mean, for so many businesses, this is now version 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. Um, and, and what does that look like? And, and the band-aid's been ripped off. Um, you know, we've got to figure out how we navigate in this new economy. And that could be somebody as simple as a, a retailer that's got to figure out how to really expand an online presence. Um, it, it could be a, again, like I was saying, companies that, that maybe there's a new segment of the market that was never available to them before. So we've just, as a, as a team, it, it's, it's honestly just evolved of, okay, we've gotten to this point, but now what, what we're basically saying for in, for, with so many of our, of our clients, as well as just us internally, is we're going to be in a really good spot by the end of the year, no matter what we are. And, and for everyone, that, that may look a little different, the opportunities they can pursue a little bit different, but this is 
this is not a time to just hunker down and try to ride this out. This is a time to, okay, let's ride this wave and see where it takes us. And we're going to steer the ship as best we can, but we're going to come out, we're going to come out on top. And, um, so we're, we're, we're passionate about that. We see a lot of opportunities out there and it's, it, it's a lot of hard work and we're certainly, you know, shoulder to shoulder with so many of these companies trying to help them through it. And there's hard days, but we've already just seen some, some really promising success stories. And, uh, that, that gets my batteries charged every day. Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, Austin and I probably uh, share a lot of the uh, sentiment that you're kind of sharing right now, because as Austin and I primarily are serving private business owners, we have uh, seen a lot of um, situations, you know, lately, as you probably have, where it's really, there's, there's two kinds of entrepreneurs that are coming out of this mess. They're coming out you know, fired up, they're coming out stronger and they're, they're going to, you know, positioning th themselves to, to thrive or they're, they're kind of laying down and, and dying. And, um, you know, I, I've, I've got a client that's in the travel industry, uh, another client in the, uh, you know, women's retail boutique, you know, uh, industry. And, um, I mean, I, I could probably list several others and what they have done in their businesses to, to pivot, and to find new ways to, to bring revenue in. Um, it's just, it's, it's incredible, frankly. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sure you're, you're seeing a lot of that. And so on that note, um, obviously companies that uh, you work with, that we work with that, that are out there are just in these unchartered territories right now. And things are changing literally by the hour for some, <laughs> for the day, for most of us. So what are some things that, um, you know, a founder, a CEO, a leadership team of a, of a business, what are some things that they can do right now to ensure that they're going to be one of those companies that are coming out of this stronger? I, I think there's a few things and it's, it's, it's interesting with the examples you just shared because it's a, it's a great segue. I was having this conversation with a client of ours a couple of weeks ago and I literally, you know, he and his partner had built this company off the ground. And, and I just said to him, you're just flexing some entrepreneurial muscles you haven't flexed in a while. I mean, you built this thing here. You, you, knew, you knew how to do it then. Um, you've just got to, you've got to retrain yourself a little bit because you're fully capable of, of doing it again. So I think, I think one thing is just perspective overall. Um, and, and so many of these businesses, again, there were a lot of very successful, profitable businesses that, I, I, the best way I've heard this whole thing described was it, it was a natural disaster on a global scale. Um, and, and so for a company that was doing great, I mean, we have a client that had a record February and then March hit. Um, that doesn't mean that anything was inherently broken with that, with that company. And, and so I think, you know, keeping that perspective in mind and what were we doing right, what got us here, um, that's a great way to even just take a step back and, and, and I think really just focus on some of those basics and again, where, where to put that entrepreneurial muscle. I think the other thing, and, and this is something that it's so easy for all of us to get caught up in, but I've really tried, um, I, I get peppered all the time and, uh, you know, with different questions, oh, I read this today or this is coming out, this is changing, whether it's laws or, um, you know, certainly we found ourselves knee deep in a lot of these different, you know, business relief um, programs and so forth that were out there stop reading headlines um, because there's for two reasons. Number one, information moves so fast and changes so quickly that today's headline in some instances is outdated within a half hour. Um, but the other side of it is it's, it's just not all that productive. And, and really what we try and do is, is help our clients peer through that noise. So, um, you know, to the example we were talking about with, with clients taking advantage of, of opportunities, um, that client that I mentioned to you, they serve, at the end of the day, their customer is a, a, a destination retail customer. You could sit here and go, well, that business is, is gone for a while. Or you could sit here and say, there's some opportunity here that some other people are leaving on the table. How do we go get that? And so I think understanding, you know, having that perspective and being able to peer through some of that noise and, it, it, you know, another great example, I mean, aerospace, parts of aerospace have been hammered through all this, obviously, with, with what's happening with air travel, but there's a lot of opportunities in aerospace. So what is this, what is really happening within your business? What opportunities does your business have? 
and focus there because the headlines really are, it, it's a lot of noise and, and, and there's a lot of, um, you know, polarization going on in our world as we know, but you know, for, for us as a team, we focus on data as much as we can because it's, it's pretty hard to manipulate and skew the, skew the data, but you can certainly put out a headline that captures, you know, 10% of the real picture and that's what gets the buzz. So I think, I think that's a, another big one. And, and then I think one that I would throw out that's, you know, we, we've talked obviously with just taking advantage of opportunities, which I think we've, we've hit that one. But the other thing that maybe is a little bit forgotten is um, for some of these business owners, who can you leverage around you? Um, you're not alone. And so whether it's your team and, and what are they, I mean, something I was talking to a client of ours who's got a decent sized sales team is just, what are your, what are your sales guys hearing out in the field? What, what are, what are he or she telling you that, that of what's, what's going on, what they're hearing from their customers, what kind of vibes they're getting, what they're seeing in their markets, um, you know, strategic partners around the business, your, your, your attorneys, your lenders, your CPAs, you've got this, this army of people, if you really think about it around you that if nothing else, then it just gains some intelligence, gains some insight, some perspective, that's hugely valuable. And that's something oftentimes we see somewhat underserved. And, and if, if some of those folks don't have the answers, you know, your, your financial professionals, like, like where you guys play, um, if you don't have that person in your network giving you that service right now, you need to find them because you're going to need them, need them to get out of this. So I think, I think that's probably one that we see underused the most, um, is just forgetting, forgetting even even a fellow business owner, um, you know, your neighbor might own a company, or or maybe you're in some sort of even loose networking group. What 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 can you get your hands on that can help you either get some clarity, discern some things, bounce something off somebody? Um, that's usually valuable because everybody right now is trying to consume as much information as they can, and I think a lot more people are willing to share than are asked. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. I think that that network is hugely important. Um, I think that as business owners, we, I mean, we're all in this room, business owners as well. You know, we, we think that we're on an island sometimes and nobody understands me and nobody gets me. And to a certain extent, it's true, but you can also surround yourself with the proper people who can, right? Mm -hmm. So for me personally, I, be, I belong to a Vistage group. That for me, it's hugely important. There's actually the owner of this complex that we're sitting in. One of the owners is, is in my Vistage group and just getting different perspectives from people that aren't going to judge you, that don't have any kind of an agenda at all as to the success or failure of what it is that you're putting out there and getting their honest, candid feedback, I think is hugely important and, and missed an awful lot by business owners. Right? I, I, ironically, I'm in Vistage as well. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> And one of the things I, I would say even to tag on to that a little bit, I think one thing Vistage teaches you is, is asking the right questions. And I think that's, a, that's an important piece of it too, is, is understand what you're asking for. Don't just ask for help. It's I need help solving X or Y. Um, because again, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of very smart people out there who have either done it um, or, or can share some very interesting insights. But yeah, a, a group like Vistage, I mean, there's the Entrepreneurs Organization, there's all sorts of different pe peer groups out there that, uh, I mean, I certainly highly recommend those. I've seen the, seen the power of what they can do. Yeah, and plenty of industry specific mm -hmm. groups that everybody can, can uh, belong to. So I think, I think just getting that feedback is, is extremely important so that you don't feel like you're doing it alone. And you see that you're not missing things, right? And sometimes your employees can provide great feedback, and, and I don't mean to diminish that at all. And, and you certainly should listen to, the, to your employees, right? I think the, the worst thing that a founder can say or an organization, period, and I think we see this way more often in big organizations, but to say something to the effect of, well, that's not the way we do it. Mm -hmm. To, to not be open to other ideas and other ways to look at things, I think, is a huge mistake. And, you know, Landon already used the word pivot, right? There have been a lot of organizations specifically in this pandemic that have had to pivot, right? The way that they've done things that have been successful for a very long period of time is not going to work, at least in the short run and maybe forever. And so they, they've got to be willing to pivot when it's appropriate. I think that sometimes young entrepreneurs specifically are pivoting too often, right? Because that can be a problem too. Um, but you've got to not be afraid to pivot when it's appropriate. You've got to be not afraid to persevere when it's appropriate. And sometimes you just have to uh, admit defeat, right? And it's just, you know, you did everything that you could and it's just not going to work out. 
And then you're really just pivoting again, right? You're finding something else to do to take care of your family or to build another business or, you know, whatever. So I think that fantastic advice and, and feedback on that and, and hugely important. So specific to, to COVID if you want, or just overall, you know, let's talk about some challenges that you see from business owners today, things that they're dealing with or ongoing that, uh, that you see and that you guys help, help entrepreneurs with. Sure. I think one of the things that that certainly COVID has has brought things more to light is, um, and I and I talked about you know business that was very, uh, we we had a client that that came to us in I think April, and she had told me we've had a very successful business we've been very profitable we've never had to worry about cash and now I do, and and so I think for for a lot of companies out there and it's it's a good. At some point, it's going to be a very valuable postmortem because it's hard to do when, when you're right in the thick of it. But I think a lot of companies are realizing some chinks in the armor, some weaknesses, some things that maybe they maybe never were never brought to light. And certainly when, you know, we've been in the benefit of what the longest economic growth period this country's ever seen, that can that can mask over some things, I, I think is one. Um, but, but I think, I think you brought up the psyche of the entrepreneur and I think there's a lot of entrepreneurs that are out there beating themselves up right now and you, you don't have it all figured out. None of us ever do. Warren Buffett doesn't have it all figured out. Jamie right. Dimon doesn't have it all figured out. Um, you know, it, it, everybody's got the things that they're really good at and it's how do you best ma maximize those and then surround yourself with good people. Um, and, and I think there is a lot, there's been a lot of damage to the entrepreneurial psyche through all this. And I think that's something that, um, you know, we, we've all got to band together and, and, and work through that, but, but all companies go through this. And so I think what, what COVID's done in a lot of ways is just accelerate some things. Um, you know, the, the, the clients we work with, and, you know, I mentioned, I mentioned some of them, we've, we've got companies that have been with us really since the start and they've evolved so much in those four and a half years that it's almost different things are constantly breaking in, in a good way oftentimes, but different things are constantly breaking. So I, I think that's, um, I, I think some of it is just there's with a natural evolutionary change, you're going to run into things. And as a small and mid-sized business, you're going to run into things that you've never run into before. Things are going to hurt. And, and honestly, you know, we use a lot of analogies around our shop, but no different than just us as people maturing. Um, you know, when I wake up some days, my back hurts in places that it didn't hurt when I was in my twenties. And that's just a simple fact of we're older and, and more mature. Businesses go through the same thing as, as you mature either in time, as you grow in size, things evolve, things change. Um, so I think, I think just being, being cognizant of that, being aware of that. And I think, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs, one of the hardest things, and, and we all can fall in this, in this boat, we don't know what we don't know all the time. And so I, I think as much as possible, being a student of your business, um, especially through this is, is, is very, very valuable um, because it is, it, and, and there are some core fundamentals that you have to make sure you have in place. And, and are you really, was your growth the last year because the economy was so great or because your sales force really figured out how to connect to the customer? You're going to know the answer to that right now. Yeah. Um, and so I think just learning as much as you can being a sponge, um, you know, those, those are probably the, the, the biggest things. And then there is, there's just some fear out there in the market. I think one of the hardest things we're dealing with is just the unknown. Um, you know, nobody is, is, are things going to shut down again? Um, you know, what if a vaccine doesn't work? What, what happens even for a lot of companies right, right now, just figuring out what their workforce, um, you know, if school doesn't go back, what about, what about your workforce and, and how long does this remote thing go and how does that work? So the uncertainty, the uncertainty is, is very challenging. And I think that's something that's been a real struggle, but there are, there are a lot of things that we all can control. And I think those are the only things we can focus on because we, we don't know if the government's going to shut something down tomorrow. We can plan what happens if they do and what happens if they don't. And I think that's the best thing we can do is just try to get out ahead of it and think about our options and the ones who, the ones who are thinking about that, that client I mentioned to you that, that is taking business away from a large competitor, we've literally got five or six different scenarios that we've mapped out. If this happens, we go here. If this happens, we go there. Um, they're not worried about what that next step is because we've, we've thought ahead. And, and I think yeah. that's, you know, that's, a, that's a key too um, because I, I think a lot of businesses are realizing as well that they don't, they don't have the foresight they maybe thought they did. Yeah. No, and, and I agree with you 100%. I think that 
two things that, that stuck out to me in what you said is having a plan is hugely important, right? And it's important to write an actual business plan. It's important to tweak an actual business plan and, and to keep that up to date and then look plan for eventualities, like you said, right? Landon and I do the same thing with our clients and, and we talk about how important that plan is and the confidence that it gives you knowing that you have a plan to follow, mm -hmm. right? So many people do things, whether it's their business or their personal finances, whatever it is, well, this, this works, right? Or maybe early on, they followed some principles that they eventually got away from, right? We'll say, for example, it, it worked so well, I stopped doing it, right? Or I didn't need to do it anymore because we've never had a cash flow issue, right? We've never had to deal with collections. We don't have any accounts receivable. Everything done is cash. We're, you know, we're good. But it's these types of things that remind us that there are certain business principles that every business should follow and stay on top of all the time. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a great spot to take a, a quick break to hear a word from our sponsor and we'll come back and talk to you some more. Great. At Paylocity, we deliver more than our awesome product suite with crazy good reviews. We prioritize your success by covering you with a deep support system to back up our easy to use, innovative HR solutions. Everything we do is designed to support you in reaching your goals. Together, we tackle your day-to-day -day work so that you can spend more time building the culture you and your employees crave. For professionals who crave true partnership, Paylocity is the HR and payroll company that frees you from the tasks of today, so together we can spend more time focused on the promise of tomorrow. Let's go forward together. All right, Tycoons, we're back with Ryan Weiss, Weissmuller with uh, Fintrepid Solutions, and it's time to get into the nuts and bolts, which I always turn over to Landon because he's a nuts and bolts kind of guy. <laughs> I, I don't even know what that means, but uh, <laughs> we'll roll with it. Um, yeah, so uh, two, two questions here uh, um, merged into one. Um, Curious where the name Fintrepid Solutions came from. So maybe you could talk to us about that. And then also, um, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here and, and assume here that you're a process guy. Uh, so I want to hear about your process. I know our, our listeners will certainly get value from learning about uh, your process and how you approach things. So if you can, uh, talk to us about those two things. Sure. That's a loaded, loaded question. <laughs> Um, so I'll give you the conscious answer on the name and then the subconscious answer, because it took me a while to figure this out. But, um, you know, as I mentioned, the, the, I, I didn't necessarily have these grand plans for years to start a firm. Um, and, and I actually, you know, taking my own advice, I, I leveraged some folks around me as, um, as I was thinking about this and kind of getting input and, and, uh, even trying to get some, some insight on branding and having never actually built a business myself. And uh, one of the one of the great things that um, that someone shared with me was really thinking about the the words that um, the words that you want to be associated with, and and one of them, and it's it's one of our taglines is grow boldly, and 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 I came up with that very early on, uh, and bold synonym of bold is is intrepid. Um, the challenging part that we live in in this in this business world out there and and uh, the global internet economy is that URLs are not as easy to find as as you would think. So, given that that certainly the financial side of the world is um, is at least a, a foundational piece to what we do, threw an F in front of it, created our own word, and uh, and, and go from there. But the, uh, the 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 funnier the funnier part of the story is, you know, I know, you know, Austin, you were talking about the personal side of it. So I remember in in college, um, a, a very good friend of mine. There was a company at the time in in Phoenix called Finova, and the CEO of that was kind of a, a legend financially in in the valley. You know, this was going back many years ago, and um, my friend and I decided one day we were going to start a business. Uh, you know, we thought Finova was a very cool name. So we were kicking, kicking around all sorts of, of other cool names that started with an F that we could throw it in front of. Um, and so I, I think that seed had probably been planted a long, long time ago. And then the reality of what I could get on GoDaddy uh, hit, hit as well. And that, those two things merged. And here we are. And now, uh, now the name's not so foreign to everyone. So I guess it's stuck at this point. <laughs> That's an interesting way to come up with a name. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, that, yeah, a, a, a story offline, but yeah, I, I just did, went through a full rebrand in my own individual practice, and so, um, 
I'm uh, very aware of those challenges coming up with the name and the meaning and the tagline and the URL and trying to package it all together. You think it's an easy thing to do. Like, oh yeah, we'll just come up with a name. It took me like six months to pick a new name. I mean, literally six months. So anyway, cool story. But uh, yeah, um, tell us about your process. How do you, you know, when you're, when you meet with a prospective, you know, client or new client, uh, just walk us through kind of your, your process and how you're, you know, getting people on board and how you're kind of serving your clients on an ongoing basis. The interesting thing about our about our business, and um, we are we are highly focused on on customization. So we're firm believers. Every every business is unique. Their culture, their climate, what they do, how they do it. That the one size fits all doesn't doesn't work. And the 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 great thing about that is obviously we're able to provide you know really good service to meet them where they are and where they're trying to go. The challenge with that is, is how do you get your arms around that? And I think that was something that, that we've certainly evolved over time. And I will tell you in the early days, uh, it, it's night and day what we've been able to, to evolve to, um, to, to handle that much better. Because at the end of the day, and in case you haven't noticed, I, I use analogies a lot. I almost feel like we're asked to come in and work on a partially built custom home. We don't know how the good the foundation is. We don't know if the owner's gonna change their mind on the color of cabinets they want. Um, we don't necessarily always have access to the to the uh, the architectural drawings, so how do you how do you work through that? How do you solve a, you know solve that going forward? And again, with that mantra of value and being there to provide solutions for our clients. So what, what, what we've developed and really refined over the years is um, you know there's a few parts to it, but that initial piece as you talked about at first contact, it's it's discovery. We ask a lot of questions before even a, a, a company or a business owner becomes a client is trying to understand. What, what are the things they've identified? Um, you know, where, where do they want to go? What are their goals? And, and just at least determining at that first level, is, is there a, a fit? And, you know, we've been fortunate. I, we're getting close now to where we've had 100 clients since we started the firm. So you, you do start to see some patterns. We've gotten good at that process and know the right questions to ask. But just getting to that point of even, do we want to continue this conversation and, and, and really look at working together, I think is a very important first piece. And then once we do that, once we get to that alignment, really the key cog of our process, because it does get very fluid after this, is, is we have an, on an onboarding process that, that we have some pretty good rigidity to. And, and what it does is it allows us to get in deep, get into our client's business, understand their numbers, talk to, talk to the people that have a hand in, in information flow, transactional flow, dollar flow, to understand who, who drives what, where, when, and how. And in taking that information, what we're able to do is, is get a very good, almost like going to the doctor and getting a physical, we're able to come out of there with a pretty good assessment of, okay, you know, this, this needs some oil over here. This is really bad. You better take some medication for this. And here's some things just to maybe use some preventative medicine for the next six years. No different than that, we come up with our initial set of findings, ideas, sit down with our clients and, and game plan collaboratively. Okay, here's what we found. Here's what we think you should do. Does this align with what you expected, what you think? And then get on the same page because alignment is, alignment is so key. Um, and again, thinking about it in the medical sense, if a patient doesn't want to treat something that a doctor you know, highlights, there's not much that doctor can, can do. Um, and same thing with us. We've got to make sure we're on the same page and that we're in, we're in agreement that we're solving the right problem. And then we get to work solve it, start attacking some of those things very quickly after we've reached that, that prioritization and that re realignment with our clients. And then from there, it's, it's the fun part, but it's also the fluid part. So we, we typically find that there's that period right after that onboarding's done that we really get in and there's some very clear targeted execution. But as you're working and as we become part of, part of that company's ecosystem, it, it, it becomes it becomes very organic and, and we may spot things or other challenges may pop up. Hey, we've got an opportunity to buy a company. You know, what do you think? Let's talk about it. Um, we've got an opportunity to expand. We may spot some things to say, you know, we never talked about this, but um, you know, there might be an issue with the way we're handling something on the manufacturing floor. And, and it, it really does become a very nice back and forth flow. I, I mean, I, you know, I, I would say most of our clients, and I know a lot of them do, just consider us part of their team. We're an extension of their team. And it's great to, it's great to be that. It's great to have that trust level. Um, and, and we want to add as much value as we can. So it's, 
it, it's, it's definitely a challenge. We always have to have that, that fluid aspect to what we do. Um, but uh, I, I think we've, we've figured out some good ways to, to manage it, maximize it, and again, make sure that we're, we're providing the highest impact that we can. Yeah, it's it's interesting listening to you to you go through that process because I would guess that Landon's on the same page as me. It sounds like you just described what our process is and what we do with our clients, right? Now, we may not get into the manufacturing side of things, but it's always about collecting data ahead of time and then showing them what we see and saying these are the things that, you know, the issues that we see and this is what we would charge for to help you get this put into place and this is the value that you're going to receive by engaging us to do that. It, it sounds like the exact same process that you're going through, you just may be targeting different aspects of the business, mm -hmm. but then we ultimately become part of their team, an extension of their team, just like you described. So it, it's funny because it did, it sounded just like if somebody had asked the same question to Landon or I, we would have given almost the exact same response. So very, very interesting. And, and honestly, for me, and this is, this is what we believe is a differentiator for us is, is that it's that process and going through and, and truly gathering data instead of having preconceived notions about what the response is or what the solution is. And so many people that do what we do have a preconceived solution. And I'm sure that you run up against it in competitors, you know, that you're dealing with where, they think that it's, it's just about making sure that their finances are in order or the books are kept clean or, you know, all those sorts of things when there's so much more to what you do and, and so much more to what we do. So it, it's interesting, the parallels. We, we probably, speaking of strategic partnerships, we probably should talk more about, <laughs> about yeah, something there, like that in the future. There you go. Well, the interesting thing too is you, you talked about, you know, certainly competitors, but even a lot of times the business owner themselves doesn't necessarily realize. And, and so, you know, again, use another analogy my elbow hurts. That might be what the business owner is saying, but why? And it could be, maybe it's nerve damage. Maybe it's, maybe you just slept funny and bumped your elbow in your sleep last night, but it's important to understand that reason before you try to go fix it. And, and I think yeah. that's sometimes, um, there's a danger in all of us to self-diagnose and there's some benefit in getting a, a trusted, you know, outside party to come in and come in and do that. But yeah, we, it's, it's challenging and you want to make sure you're diagnosing things appropriately. And I'm sure you guys run into that too, but um, we've just found we have to be, that's an area that we just don't skimp on. We don't rush through. If we can't go through our process or if someone's coming to us saying, I don't want to do that, it's probably not going to be a fit because yeah. that's really so central to us being able to add that value, understand what's there. Um, because we're not, we're not very good at telling people what they want to hear. Yeah. Um, you know, we're there to, we're there to leverage our experience. Yeah, no, I, I may have shared this with Landon. Maybe it was on air, so if it was, I apologize. But um, I, I had a client, I guess. It, it was a customer that I had taken over from an advisor that had departed, right? And so I was reaching out to him wanting to, to know more about him and say, you know, let's review this. Let's review your overall financial picture and, you know, discuss what, what should be done here, what, how we can help. And he said, well, I have, I have this product and, and you just need to tell me what I, what I should do with it. I said, I, I can't, I, I don't know anything about you. I don't know anything about your financial situation. All I know is that you have this one product with this amount of money in it and that's it. Mm -hmm. And I'm a fiduciary and I can't, I can't give you advice on that. And if somebody else is giving you advice on what you should do without asking you those questions, then they're doing you a disservice as well. And, and so we, we actually agreed to, to reconnect later, but I said, unless you're willing to share with me more information about your financial situation, then you're better off seeking advice from somebody else because I just won't give it to you. So it, it is, and it, and it is kind of a lost art because guys are just, they want to be able to make the sale one way or another, and they're not truly looking out for what's best for the customer and making sure that a process is being followed. So I, I applaud you for doing that the, the, the right way in my estimation. So. Um, so we've got the process. It's about gathering information, of course, but when it's time to actually go to work, right, you've got a process, of course, for that and different things that you do. And you have, a, you call it the seven skills businesses must have. So tell us a little bit about that, what it went into it. And you know, that was something that's definitely been an evolution. And we, we talked about, you know, some of the themes and some of the things we've noticed. And I think going back to what I said about the, the popsicle sticks and paper glue, small and mid-sized businesses can't afford perfect. 
they can't afford the the resources that Bank of America or Freeport MacMoran or you know these very large companies have at their disposal. They don't have armies of people. They don't have armies of or, you know uh, bundles of capital. So what what we were finding is is some themes and some challenges of how do you how do you get to what works for your business with a solution that you can actually afford and actually manage and, and, and keep in place? And I think that was really where, where the seven skills started was, was how do we frame something up around that? And then, and then looking at it, just some of the themes around the business and I'll, I'll it, it does work very foundationally, but the first and foremost is just having good numbers. And especially right now, it's so critical because as I was talking about, you know, business owners understanding what's going on in their business, not just listening to the noise externally, you've got to have good data to be able to do that. So, you know, what's, what's happening with your sales? What's happening? Are, are expenses creeping up when they shouldn't be? Are you not seeing the sales that you expected? The, the, having that good data is so foundational because that's what allows you to do everything else. And that's what we realized. And, and we, use, we use a line around our office too. It's one of our core values of, of the concept of good enough. Get it to good enough where, again, it's going to pass muster. It's going to give you the information that you need to make decisions. But it may not be worth getting something from 93% accuracy to 97% accuracy. Are you really going to make a different decision? Probably not. Um, so that concept of good enough and using that and then from that, you know, everything really extends from there. That's what allows you to get in and really understand what, what are the key drivers in my business? What really moves it? And, and when we talked about planning and even moving around different scenarios, that's something that we spend a ton of time on is what's really going to drive things. Um, I, I remember when, when COVID first went into, went into effect and, and we were working with a client and really talking about, okay, wh where do we go? How do we reshape our cost structure? And, and they were, the, the CEO was really hung up on marketing costs and, and why well, should just cut this and I'll do this tomorrow. Marketing costs was, was like 1% of his expense budget. He could have cut it to zero and it wasn't going to help him solve anything, but he saw as an area where I'm not getting the ROI, I need to address this first. And, and really the answer was they need to look at some things around purchasing. They could cut some, you know, T and E, obviously there were a lot of other areas. So I think understanding what moves the needle and, and that's a little bit of a lost art too, because in every business we found there's usually three to five, sometimes as many as seven things that, that move that needle. But those, those key business drivers, understanding cash, we talked about that cash flow. Um, you know, it's overused cash is king. I'm not a fan of throwing those kinds of things out, but we are seeing in this day and age and in this time we're in cash is everything because a business that doesn't have cash right now is probably not going to make it because you're probably not going to get it from somewhere externally. Yeah. Um, so, so understanding that cash within your business, you know, understanding the different parts of your business. And, you know, we see this a lot and run into it. I'll, I'll give you an, you know, and a lot of this did come out of examples. We had a manufacturing company we were working with and they basically had three lines of business. And the, the CEO was making good enough money where he was pretty happy. But when we dove in a little bit, we actually realized that one of his lines of business was actually losing about 15% a year if you isolate it on its own. So he slashed that business, eventually took some time, slashed that business, uh, had fewer headcount, less headaches, and made more money the next year. Yep. But, but just looking at very surface level, never would have spotted that. Um, you know, we, we talked about the, just planning. And I think that's one key. And again, if you don't have that foundation, if you don't understand those business drivers, if you don't know the risks within your business and, and you know, how a lot of companies right now are rethinking how they're going to deal with shocks in the future. A lot of them are keeping more cash on hand. I'm sure in you guys' world, a lot, of, a lot of your clients are wanting to sit on a little more cash right now than maybe they would, you know, yep. a year ago. Um, so, so how do you withstand risk? What does that look like? What risks am I insuring myself against and what risks am I basically self-funding? Meaning I need to make sure I have the cash on hand to pay my people if we can't, uh, you know, open my manufacturing floor for a month. Um, and then, and then using that to, to plan and, and to have, you know, I, I liken, I liken planning. I went to school down in, down in Tucson at the U of A. If I'm going from Phoenix to Tucson, I know the route I want to take, but I also know that if there's an accident on the I-10 or a road closure here and there, there's a few other routes I could go. And, and I think that's the best way that, that I like to describe planning is you're not trying to nail every aspect of the journey. You just want to have thought through what your options are so you can still get there and get to that goal. Um, because chances are you're not going to have an unimpeded route getting there as, as a business owner. But if you don't have all those foundational pieces ahead of time, 
it is very hard to, to plan and figure that out. So, you know, very sequential. And, and I think some, some companies we found, um, you know, have a skill set in certain areas they don't in others. But I would tell you the ones who we've just found, the ones who have the seven nailed are far better positioned, are faring much better through, um, you know, through even this COVID disruption. And that doesn't mean you're not constantly sharpening that skill, but I, I think it's just the things that we've found, the practical steps that these small and mid-sized businesses can, can take to make sure that they have enough, um, enough efficiency, enough capability, enough of a skill set that they can compete. And, and that's really at the end of the day, all these businesses are trying to do is is carve out a niche for themselves and, and achieve their goals and just some key foundational pieces. So it, it was, it, I would say that piece has probably been about a three year evolution that we, we finally all put on, put on paper. We've been using it for a while, but put it on paper about six months ago. So um, something we use a lot now. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's funny because we, we break ours up into four different areas that we help business owners with. And so, it, it, again, it sounds very similar, which is, which is great to hear. So let's take a quick break to hear from another one of our sponsors, and then we'll come back and talk to you about what the future holds. Whether you're an established local company or a brand new startup, you can count on GBS to be part of your family. We're not just any benefits consulting firm, we're GBS. We have nearly 30 years of experience in group benefits, a strong sense of purpose, and it shows. GBS, believe in something better. GBSbenefits.com. All right, Tycoons, we're back, and I'm going to turn it over to Landon and let him bring us home. Yeah, it's my, fav my favorite time of the show when... We've uh, gotten some, some great information from our guests, but we've just got a little bit of extra time, which allows me to ask some, uh, we'll call them unplanned questions. Um, so um, before we hear a little bit about what's next for your firm, definitely excited to hear about that. Um, in your bio, you mentioned that um, you guys actually received an award uh, m and Firm of the Year for the Southwestern U.S. by Acquisitions International. Um, selfishly, I would, I'd love to hear a little bit more about, um, about that leg of your business and also um, in Austin and I's experience right now, um, a lot of older, you know, entrepreneurs, they, uh, you know, they're on that, uh, and the, the, this is not uh, my uh, my words. I'm stealing these from someone else. But they're on that that five year plan where every year they say, you know, I, oh, five years, five years, five years, five years. So I think now in the times that we are living in, in the situation that a lot of business owners are finding themselves in, um, that is actually going to be changing. Where they're saying, okay. No, no more five years. Like I, I want to start figuring stuff out now. So, tell us, is that something that you're experiencing, and um, what what else is going on in, in the you know buying and selling a businesses world, and and maybe you know uh, share some some thoughts with our listeners that they can uh, benefit from. Well, I and I. I appreciate you bringing that up. It, the the, uh, the award candidly was a complete surprise, um, and and even the the M and A side of what we do. So my my partner Nick and I, who Nick's been with me since almost the beginning, and we both had a background uh, doing a lot of of buying and selling with in our in our careers, and so it was something that we we found there was a need for, uh, you know, quite frankly, companies needed help from the inside in helping them navigate that, whether they were buying or, or as you mentioned, selling. So it, it's, it's become something that um, I think we've become a little bit of a go-to go -to for. We're certainly working on a number of transactions right now. And I think we, I think we did six or seven last year, uh, you know, either, either purchase or sale. So something we developed some, some acumen around. Um, and, and it is, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's a theme and I actually see it in a, in a couple of different ways. So we've got companies that we're working with right now. And, and I think this is something I'd, I'd actually challenge a lot of business owners to explore as, as an option. Um, the, 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 ep, the economic challenge that we're in, we'll use that word, uh, 
has maybe, as you said, shortened the plan for some folks where somebody who was saying, I'm going to hang on for two or three more years may just be saying, I, I want out. I don't want to do this anymore. Too much brain damage. There are going to be some buying opportunities for companies that are in the position to be able to buy right now. And I think that's going to be one thing that's really going to drive that activity over the next six to 18 months. The, the, the challenge and the interesting piece is uh, I, I think there's a lot of, of desire on the part of businesses to acquire. There's a lot of desire on the part of, of equity to acquire and certainly private equity. We're seeing even the small and mid-sized space that private equity is buying smaller deals than they used to. But what is the challenge right now is the bank financing is not necessarily there. So we've seen some deals get stretched out. We've seen some deals delayed. We've seen some deals put on hold, but, but I expect that to continue. And I think there's going to be, you know, smaller companies are going to be buying smaller mom and pops and, and picking that up. I think there's still good opportunities for other businesses um, to potentially position them to, to, to sell. We, we had a client that actually sold in May that wasn't all that impacted by what happened and, and still, you know, got a good value. And, um, and believe me that that buyer kicked the tires in that company, like nobody's business uh, a <laughs> little more thoroughly than, than maybe pre COVID, but there's still going to be those opportunities out there. I, I think the thing that's going to be very, very interesting is just seeing where it's just, un, it's uncertain right now. And, and I, I am very bullish on, on the M and a side of things over the next five years, because I do think there's going to be a lot of activity there's just a lot of specifically uncertainty around a transaction right now and just what that looks like. And, and even, even getting insurance for transactions right now, there's a lot of unknowns that um, I, I think you're going to see a lot of pent up the demand that, that let's just say, for example, I know everybody talks about it. If there's a viable vaccine and that's what all of a sudden calms a lot of at least the psychology out there. I think you could see a wave of, of acquisitions really kick in because the, the market's right. And the thing we have to remember too you know, like I told you with some of the companies out there that were in really good position in February, th there's a lot of companies that are still quite healthy. They got, they got impacted by what happened. They're not irreparably broken. Um, so I think that's a trend that we expect to continue. And, and you know, we, um, I, I think it's going to be an area that continues to be an impactful part of our business is helping, helping our clients, uh, you know, navigate through that process, whether they're trying to buy or sell. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure uh, if there's any private equity groups uh, listening, that they're going to be uh, excited to hear those words uh, of, uh, you know, there's gonna be a lot more opportunities in, in the near future here. And I certainly agree with you. I think uh, that will be the case. Because, um, you know, as I listen to a lot of the private equity groups and, and their thoughts right now, is it, uh, it, it, what I've gathered is that there's a lot of money out there right now they call it dry powder i think they're saying a trillion or two trillion dollars of essentially money that's sitting on the sidelines as these these groups are, are looking for investment opportunities but there's just there's just not enough of them and that probably leads into that comment that you just made about now they're having to go down market a little bit and look for these smaller deals which which is cool and exciting for smaller businesses that are maybe doing you know, a million to $5 million in, in EBITDA. Now they, they might be, you know, shopped by private equity groups, which um, is cool and exciting. So um, I, I appreciate you mentioning that. The, the one word of caution too, that I would throw out though is, and, and we've, we've actually seen this in a couple instances, there are buyers out there lowballing. So as, as a business owner, um, especially if your business wasn't broken pre COVID, just be, make sure you're not um, selling yourself short um, because that, that's out there. And, and I think you're going to see some buyers use COVID as a, as a reason maybe to knock down some of those valuations that, um, you know, we, we've had that conversation with one company of ours that they're, they're potentially looking at selling for too little. Um, so it's, it's, it's happening out there. Yeah. Yeah. Good advice. Absolutely. Um, so as we're kind of coming to a close here, um, we want to make sure we leave, you know, at least a, you know, a minute, 90 seconds so that you can tell us and our listeners how, how to track you and your team down. But um, just talk to us for a couple of minutes here about what's, what's next for your firm. Where are you guys going here? That is the, uh, that's the million dollar question. Um, you know, certainly what, what has happened with, uh, with the, this current disruption is we've, we've found, um, I think we found that our skill set, while, while I guess I always knew it was applicable in a lot of different areas, we found ourselves adding value in some ways that maybe we, we weren't planning on six to 12 months ago. 
Um, but to be honest, in, in a bit of taking my own advice, one of the things that I always challenge our customers with, you know, when everybody, not everybody, but a lot of them come and say, we want to grow. And one of my first comments back is, okay, toward what end? And, and what do you want to grow? And so I think taking some of that, some of that own, you know, that own medicine, we, we've been fairly cautious in how we've grown. I, I consider myself very blessed to have the team that we do. Um, you know, that are, that are passionate about that same mission, you know, excellent at customer service, really care about our customers, that if we find some opportunities to continue to grow, we'll absolutely do it. But for me, at the end of the day, I, I love, I love getting up and, and being able to have an impact and, and touch so many of these businesses. And, and, you know, we've got clients out there that they're not publicizing, nor are we, that they're clients of ours that we see splashes here or there. That's what charges our batteries every day. Um, so I think, you know, at the end of the day, we want to keep doing what we've, what we've been doing. And I, I think the, the mission we set out and, and really that focus on value and, and carving out this niche has served us so well, it's certainly evolved and I expect that evolution is going to continue, but we just want to right now help more companies survive and thrive. You know, three years from now, I expect we're going to be doing the same thing. And, um, I, I'm confident other opportunities are going to, uh, pop up, but, we're going to be intentional because that's what we're telling all of our clients to do. So we'll see where it takes us. I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. Well, we're, we're, we're excited uh, for you and we'd love to have you back on the show in you know, six or 12 months and, and hear about your progress and what, what you guys are up to. But um, uh, there's going to be some people that are going to want to track you down. I'm pretty confident of that. I think uh, you've dropped um, a lot of, you know, value bombs here and um, a lot of great information that people are going to be able to take and apply into their business and, and, and really just to help to shift their, their mindset a little bit. Uh, so kudos uh, to you and, and everything you've shared. So thank you. But uh, just in closing here, uh, what is the best way for people to, uh, to track you guys down to find you? Sure. E easiest way would, uh, would be our website. So fintrepidsolutions.com, intrepid with an F in front of it. Um, <laughs> that would be the best way. We, um, we actually do a couple of webinars a month. We started a webinar series through all this. So there's access to that. You can get access to LinkedIn. Uh, we've got a blog that we do. So we're trying to put out as much content as we can right now, but it's all there. Certainly, you know, reach out. And, and the, the thing too, that's nice about where we are is there's a lot of non-clients that will help at times too. So I'm always happy to be a resource. I'm passionate about this entrepreneurial community, but uh, check out the, uh, check out the website and, uh, you know, certainly connect with me on LinkedIn. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, since we started that almost hundred firms, I had actually heard of four of them before they became clients of ours. So I'm excited to see, uh, you know, who else we don't know about that's uh, doing really cool stuff right now. Yeah, that's awesome. And, and Landon and I, are, I found the same thing actually with this radio program is that it's given us access to business owners that we didn't previously mm -hmm. know as well. And, you know, we, we, I personally thought I had a great, you know, finger on the pulse of the Phoenix business and, and uh, business group, I guess I'm losing my, my train of thought there, but, and then Landon in Las Vegas, but uh, it does. I mean, having this LinkedIn network or Vistage or, the radio program, whatever it, it helps us to connect with more business owners and be able to serve them, whether they hire us or not. Yep. So it's awesome. Thank you so much for what you guys are doing. I think it's great. Yeah. Thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Appreciate you. Thanks. Take care. You've been listening to tycoons of small biz proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast platform. All right, we're clear. You can you can drop the f bomb. Value bombs. 